last Sunday. On our connection card, we had a question. So I want to open up and start with this. The question was, where was the most unusual place you found money? And we had a number of different responses that were given to this. Um, uh, some, someone wrote down, uh, in a bag of chips. Now, I don't know, I, I'm particularly fond of nacho cheese Doritos and barbecue chips, so it must have been a different flavor because I've never found money in those bags. But, uh, but yeah, in a bag of chips. Someone else said washed up on a beach in Florida. Someone said that they were at the store. They were uh, trying on a new pair of Levi pants, and they found a $10 bill in the pocket. So they checked all the other pockets still. <laughs> uh, someone uh, in the little space we provide, they wrote all of this. They said, when going through some old clothes an aunt had given my mom, I put on a coat. Excuse me, I'm about ready to sneeze. Put on a coat, reached in the pocket, which that's kind of a risky thing if this is a coat from an aunt. But anyway, um, <laughs> reached in the pocket and found a roll of money, hundreds of dollars. I just want to ask, does your aunt have any other coats she wants to give away? <laughs> I, I actually got, this, was, this is the only time this has ever happened. Um, you know, this, this was in last Sunday's bulletin. And at 11.45 last night, someone emailed me and said, I want to add to, I just now read the bulletin, okay? And uh, I want to add my answer um, to the question. And uh, here's, here's what she said. She said that uh, the most unusual place was in dog poo. <laughs> yeah. She said it was a $20 bill. She also said that wasn't the only time it's happened. <laughs> oh, my. I, you know, I've heard of the goose that lays a golden egg, but I've never heard of this dog. Not till today. The most common response that, uh, most common response that I got, uh, several people put down, blowing through a parking lot. So if some of you in here are into playing the odds and you're hoping to make a little money this afternoon, just, you know, go to a parking lot in your spare time and just wait and watch. <laughs> Good luck. Well, today's story, my notes actually say this, today's story surpasses all of those. Not really sure about the dog now, though. I don't know if it surpasses the dog story, but... Uh, but it's a very unusual story. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's only four verses long. And, and part of the interesting thing about this is this is one of those things that is recorded in Scripture that is only found in one Gospel. It's not found in the other three Gospels. Now, if I was going to speculate as to why Matthew's and not the other three... I would say that perhaps it had something to do with Matthew's background. Matthew had been a tax collector. And uh, so maybe this registered with him and stuck with him more than it did the others. I don't know that for sure. But anyway, here's the account. Only four verses long. Matthew 17, starting in verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the double drachma tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the double drachma tax? Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? Who do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes from? From their sons or from strangers? Let's just pause. We're only halfway through it. But, but so we got a couple of guys that apparently keep track of this sort of thing. Because who... who would remember, you know, this. Um, but uh, perhaps they were part of people that worked in the temple and did collect this particular tax. And so, so they, they approach Simon Peter and say, uh, 
Does Jesus, he don't pay taxes? I mean, what's the deal here? And Peter's like, oh, he does. And then when Peter goes in the house, Jesus is the first one to speak. So Peter doesn't even say, hey, I just met two guys that were asking. And he doesn't even do that. But Jesus is Jesus. And he already knows, you know, what has just happened. And, and so he starts the conversation with Peter. And he says, what do you think? When a king is collecting taxes, does he tax his sons or does he tax strangers? And that's what Peter's answering here when he says, from strangers. And so Jesus said, then the sons are free. But so that we won't offend them, go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. The coin would have had enough value to, to pay both Jesus' tax and um, Peter's tax that apparently was, was due. And so this is the unusual part about this, that he's to go and he's to, to throw a line in the water and catch a fish. And Peter had been a fisherman by trade, not typically with a fishing pole, more with a net, but, but I mean, certainly he knew how to use a pole. And so he went and he cast a line in and he caught this fish. And inside the fish's mouth was this coin. Now, I've done a fair amount of fishing in my life. Um, I haven't done a great deal in the last 20 years. Um, but for the first 35, 36 years of my life, I, I, did, I did quite a bit. Really enjoyed it. Um, and, and still do if I have the opportunity today. Uh, and when I've caught fish, I've found a fair number of things inside fish sometime in their mouth and a lot of times in their belly. One of the things that you do, and for those of you that don't do this or don't know this, you're going to think this really sounds gross, but, but it's really not. But uh, when, when, you catch, when you catch a fish, and it's the type of fish that you like to catch and, and all, one of the things you do when you're cleaning the fish is you check to see what's in its stomach because that gives you a pretty good idea of what they're feeding on. And that helps you in knowing you know, what to fish with, what type of bait or artificial lures or whatever to use. And so over the years, when, when I've caught fish, sometimes with, without even starting to clean them, there are things I've found, but, uh, but usually it's when I'm cleaning them, um, that uh, I found crawdads. I found a slug of crawdads because I primarily fish when I fish for bass. And fish, uh, bass love crawdads. Um, I found smaller fish. Sometimes it's surprising, you know, how big the smaller fish are. But again, if you're fishing for largemouth bass, there's a lot more room for that fish to swallow something. I found frogs. I found hooks. I remember finding an old rusted spinner inside a fish that apparently had been there for quite some time. That fish had been uh, towing around. And I found um, many times plastic worms, which is a form of artificial bait. And, uh, um, you know, and, and when a bass hits the end of one of those, that's not where the hook is. And so sometimes the risk is the, the plastic worm will be ripped in half. And either it'll float to the surface after the strike or the fish may swallow it. And so there have been times I've cleaned fish and it was like, ah, so that is where my worm went. This was the fish that struck earlier in the evening. Yeah, I found a variety of things inside fish, but I have never found money. Never. All those years of fishing. You know, I, I'm going to speculate on this because I looked in the Bible and, and even looked and see if there was something on the footnote that would tip me off, and there wasn't any footnote or anything. But I'm going to speculate in saying that uh, it was on this occasion that the practice of catch and release first started. Because I'm thinking Peter was thinking, this fish has more value to me back in the water than it does in my skillet. Because I might catch it again and make some more money out of this guy. Yeah, of all places, he found money in a fish. Now, this particular tax most likely it was the temple tax. I guess I haven't mentioned that. 
um, some of the Greek terminology that is used in reference to the tax in those four verses uh, helps us to draw that conclusion. If you go way back in the Old Testament, during the days of Moses in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13, it specifically refers to that tax. It was an annual tax. If you were 20 years of age or older, you were responsible every year to pay this tax. The money was used for the upkeep of the tabernacle, later the more permanent structure, the temple. Um, it cost money to run the temple. Go figure. You know, I mean, you, you stop and think about incense. You think about the table of showbread and the supplies that would be needed for that. You talk about the morning sacrifices. You had evening sacrifices. Priests, they had special garments, robes that they had to wear, the upkeep and the replacement of those robes. I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily cheap. I mean, it cost money for the tabernacle and then in later years, um, the temple. And that's what this tax was for. Now, here's, here's what I'm going to do. Since Jesus, in verse 25, mentions kings and their taxes, I'm going to use this passage as a springboard for us to take this, step, this uh, subject a step further this morning. Not that paying taxes to the government is anybody's favorite subject to talk about. I actually asked upstairs how many of you this... Uh, uh, you know, is a topic you like to hear about because you like to pay taxes. And uh, upstairs, I had two people, you know, raise their hands. I I think they were senile, but you know, they raised their <laughs> they raised their hand. But uh, uh, yeah, it's the minority minority of people say that they like to pay taxes. But the fact of the matter is, there are multiple scriptures that talk about this subject. And it's been a while since I've talked about it, and so, so this is what we're going to talk about today. And just so I uh, um, um, can get a feel for it, l let me go ahead and ask you, how many? because I did see just a moment ago, a couple people wanted to raise their hand. How many of you actually have no issue whatsoever paying taxes? Now, I worded it different. How many of you have no issue? Okay, there's a few hands going up. And probably the thing you're thinking about is you're thinking about, you know, the infrastructure of our country and the road system and, you know, all the services that are provided and, and firehouses and all this kind of stuff that's made possible, you know, and, and that obviously would, I think, you know, cause a person uh, to say yes. But there's, there's um, just as many reasons or more that would cause a person to want to keep their hand down. Um, in regards to that. So here's the passage I want to show you. It starts in Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. It goes to verse 22, so it'll take a couple of slides to show you this. This was toward the tail end of Jesus' ministry. So Jesus has served the better part of his three-year ministry by this particular point in time, and so, so his name is out there. People are familiar with Jesus. And he's got some followers, but he also has some opponents. This passage is going to be talking about some of those opponents. Here's what it says. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to trap him by what he said. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. You defer to no one, for you don't show partiality. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Some of your translations say, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, there's basically two groups that are being mentioned here. On the one hand, you have the Pharisees, and it's specifically referencing that the Pharisees sent their disciples, but they, they represent the Pharisees, okay? So one group is representatives of the Pharisees. The other group are what are called Herodians. You may not be quite as familiar with that term, uh, though it's certainly in Scripture as it is in this passage. These two groups were polar opposites, from one another. These were not people that hung out together. These were not people that said, hey, there's a Chiefs game this afternoon. How about you come over to my house and we're going to watch the game? They didn't do that because these groups didn't like each other. 
The only reason they joined forces was because they both hated Jesus and they wanted to see Jesus destroyed. And so that's what brought them together. The Pharisees absolutely hated the Roman occupation. Rome had conquered Israel, you know, a number of years earlier, and so they had soldiers there, they had Pilate, they had, you know, King Herod, who was king over that region, and all of this, this kind of stuff. And the Pharisees absolutely hated the Romans and wanted nothing to do with them. They tried to minimize any contact that they would ever have with uh, Romans and Roman soldiers. Now, the Herodians, on the other hand, they actually valued Roman ties. They were strong supporters of, of King Herod uh, because they saw value in all of this. And, and uh, so that put them at polar opposites from one another in a very fundamental way. And so these two groups, they come to Jesus, and after a little bit of flattery, they try to trap Jesus with a question. The flattery is, uh, teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. You defer to no one, for you don't show partiality. Now, in actuality, all those words are true, but they weren't speaking from their hearts. They were just setting him up trying to flatter him, and then they were going to lower the boom, the question that was going to lead to his undoing. They thought that this particular question, um, no matter how Jesus answered the question, that he would, in effect, condemn himself. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Is it or is it not right? What, that was the question. They thought there was only two answers to that question. They thought either Jesus is going to say, yes, you should pay taxes, or he was going to say no. If he said yes, then the Pharisee, the group representing the Pharisees, uh, they were going to accuse Jesus of being a traitor and in favor of Roman occupation, and that would turn the general population totally against Jesus. That would make him very unpopular. But if Jesus had said no, then the Herodians, they were going to jump in high gear and they were going to accuse Jesus of being a revolutionary and they were going to hand him over to the Roman authorities for trial and probable execution on that basis. And so the way they were looking at it, it, it was a win-win situation. Either way, Jesus answers the question. But what Jesus does, what he says... Um, was totally unexpected. Here's the way the rest of the passage reads. But perceiving their malice, Jesus said, why are you testing me, hypocrites? See, he saw right through all of this. Show me the coin used for the tax. So they brought him a denarius. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them. Caesar's, they said to him. Then he said to them, therefore, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. They didn't know what to do with that. It was like, uh, okay, we didn't anticipate this. So they just walked away from him. But Jesus is saying, produce a coin. And of course, somebody had a coin with him. And whose image is that? Well, Caesar, all right. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Here's part of the teaching point that I want to make out of this. As Christians, we have a dual citizenship. If you're here today, or if you're listening to this message, and you, you are a follower of Christ, you are a Christian, then the reality of the matter is you, in a manner of speaking, have a dual citizenship. On the one hand, the Bible, uh, it was Paul who talked about it, and he refers to this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. 
So he specifically uses the terminology of that our citizenship is in heaven. This isn't an isolated passage of scripture. This isn't the only time that the Bible seems to indicate that that is where our real home ultimately is at. There's other passages. I mean, Jesus had talked about this sort of thing on numerous occasions, even way back at the beginning of his ministry. He was dropping fairly clear hints regarding all of this and even the very last full day of his life before he was crucified on that occasion he said and it's recorded in john chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 he says in my father's house are many rooms if it were not so i would have told you i'm going there to prepare a place for you so that i then can come back and take you to be where i am he was talking about their permanent home He was reminding them, here he is, about ready to be crucified the next day. And he's saying, he's saying, you've got a home on the horizon, a home that's waiting for you. And I'm going to be preparing that for you. You're not going to be staying here. You're eventually going to be in that home. But even early in Jesus' ministry, in, in passages like Matthew 6, Jesus said these words. He said, don't store up for yourselves. Treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Again, the whole thought here is Jesus says, don't become so fixated on the here and now, this life, so focused on living a comfortable life and building a a nice nest egg and everything is all about the here and now. Don't become that way because this stuff is all going to perish. Thieves are going to steal it. Rust is going to rot it, destroy it, and moths and But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus was trying to get his followers to look beyond just the here and now. Don't have tunnel vision in the way that you approach your life. Why? It's because as followers of his, our home is on the horizon, is in heaven. And that's why Paul said in Philippians 3.20, that is where our citizenship is at. But here's the thing temporarily for the time being our citizenship is also here while we live our lives in the here and now and the bible explains how we have some responsibilities while we are still here and part of those responsibilities involve our government and the bible's real clear it's not just some vague you know portion of a verse that all of these kinds of thoughts are built on no the scripture is pretty clear about it let me give you three specifics so we'll even go beyond just talking about the tax part of all of this what are are some of our responsibilities in the here and now where our present temporary citizenship is in this realm in this world what are some of our responsibilities one we are to pray for our leaders and the Bible's pretty clear that this is going beyond lead, talking about the subject of leaders in a church, though it's good to pray for your leaders in a church. It's also talking about leaders in the government. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 1, says this, First of all, I encourage you to make petitions, prayers, intercessions, and prayers of thanks for all people, for rulers, and for everyone who has authority over us. Pray for these people so that we can have a quiet and peaceful life, always live in a godly and reverent way. This is good and pleases God our Savior. You see, we are to pray for our rulers, the Scripture says. And so while we're looking at that verse, let me ask the question, when was the last time you prayed for our president? Just think about that. When was the last time you prayed for our president when was the last time you prayed for our previous president when was the last time you prayed for our governor here in kansas when was the last time you prayed for some of the representatives some of the senators the politicians there in washington dc 
Now you might be thinking, oh, let me think. Yeah, um, I, you know, it was a Bible study, and I, I think, yeah, it was five weeks ago. Someone brought it up as a prayer request. That, you know, so that's probably the kind of thinking that some in this room are having. Now, if I had asked a different question, and I said, when was the last time you complained about our president? When was the last time you complained about our state governor? You know, we probably wouldn't have to search our memory banks quite as much, right? Be like, oh, yeah, I didn't yesterday, but it was Friday. You know, I mean, we'd probably come up with some kind of an answer like that. But, you know, the Bible nowhere instructs us to gripe and complain about politicians. But it does instruct us to pray for them, to pray for our leaders. And maybe we should do a little more praying and a little less complaining, okay? That, that's part of our responsibility while we're in this realm. Number two, respect and honor our leaders. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 says this, Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, and the emperor was basically, is basically a word for king. That's the way the word used in Rome. Um, whether to, to the king as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to pray, uh, praise those who do what is good. So it talks about submitting, um, but the flow of the passage, there's verse 15 and 16, and here's verse 17, you know, and it uses the word honor here, honor the emperor. And so we are to respect and honor our leaders. Now, of course, anytime this comes up, in a Bible study type setting especially, um, I always get someone if not multiple people that end up responding with a question, they say, yeah, but, you know, and their argument kind of goes along these lines, what if our government leader is a shyster? What if he is a scoundrel? What if she, you know, is a person that has no character or no integrity? I mean, surely we're not expected to to respect them and to honor them because they don't deserve it. They haven't earned it. And that's usually the direction this goes. And my response to that generally is this. Respect and honor is still our responsibility. The scriptures laid it out there. This is our responsibility as followers of Christ, that we are to respect and honor our government leaders. Though it may very well, in a lot of cases, end up being more for the office than it is for the person holding the office. Okay? It may not be because of the person and we just feel drawn to honor and respect them. Yeah, it may not be that, but it's the office. They're in the position of authority. And so the Bible instructs us that we are to respect and honor them. So whether we're talking about someone in Washington, D.C., or we're talking about someone over in Topeka, or we're talking about a police officer because they're law enforcement, they're in positions of authority over us as well, we show them respect due to the position of authority that they are in. The Bible's really clear about this, that that, that is our calling, that is part of our responsibility. As Christians. And then, of course, uh, number three, and this isn't necessarily exhaustive, but it gives you, you three good ideas of, of what the Bible clearly teaches regarding our responsibility to our leaders in our country. We are to pay our taxes. And the passage I have on the screen is the one where Jesus says uh, to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to give to God the things that are God's. And that leads me to say this. Though there is not a specific verse that words it exactly like this, yet I stand by this because I believe this is in the spirit of these different passages we're looking at. A good Christian is a good citizen. Now, I believe the Bible teaches that, and that should be the way that we approach things. 
Because we understand that part of God's design is that our governing authorities be in place. Sure, our government may not be perfect, but it's there for a reason all the same. Let me show you another passage that strings together more verses. And this is something you can look at um, further later, uh, because we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But uh, it's Romans chapter 13. Now, that's a typo. It should be verse 1 to 3. It's not 1 to 13. Uh, But here's the way, and the passage goes on. I'm going to show you all the way through verse 7. But uh, here's the way the first three verses read. It says, everyone must submit to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command. And those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Then do what is good. And you will have its approval. He continues this flow of thought. For government is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For government is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. All right, now, as though... He's not being clear enough or delivering the point. He's going to now say what he's saying in verses 6 and 7, and he's going to become very crystal clear on some of this. He says, and for this reason you pay taxes. This is part of why taxes is part of the equation. Since the authorities are God's public servants continually attending to these tasks, pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, Tolls to those you owe tolls. Respect to those you owe respect. And honor to those you owe honor. The passage is pretty clear. And and the thing that I want to add to this, because um, it, it should have significant impact on the way you interpret this passage. You you need to be reminded of this little a tidbit of information. While Paul was writing these words, giving instructions to the Christians, the church in Rome, guess who was sitting on the throne? It was Nero. And Nero was a nasty guy. I mean, he was a nasty guy to a point that I don't think during our lifetimes any of us can say we've ever had a president that even came close to Nero. Since the founding of this country, we've never had a president that would come close to Nero. Nero not only was a nasty guy, but he became extremely brutal, even directed especially to Christians as time went on. You know, and if you're clueless, if you still haven't connected some dots here, who invented crucifixions? Where did that whole notion come from? It was the Romans. It was this government that Paul is given these words of instruction. Now, it wasn't in the first century it had been invented. It had already been practiced for some time now. The Romans had been doing it. But nonetheless, it's in that context that Paul still says what he does in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. And so, so, you know, for us to say, well, that, that's really not rele- relevant, those verses there, because, uh, you know, because I can think of this and this and this about certain politicians, and, and that means that they've disqualified themselves from me ever respecting them or honoring them. And I'll, you, you got to back that up, that kind of thinking, because you got to remember the context that these verses were originally penned in. Now, for several years now, um, there, there has been this uh, tendency, um, how should I say this, um, for people not to trust politicians. Do you agree with that? Yeah. The reality is, and this, this even starts way back 
in uh, some of the years that I wasn't paying attention to any of this stuff. Back in the mid-60s is when this really started gaining momentum. So it's been going on now for a little over 50 years. And back in the mid-60s, for some of you that, that are aware of that particular time period and all, uh, there was a number of things like the Vietnam War that was going on, civil unrest that was going on. Immediately on the heels of that, you have Watergate and, you know, some of this stuff. And, 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 and there's probably, you know, three or four other things, too, that we could think of that to add to this. But uh, um, a lot of people just don't trust politicians. They don't think they're trustworthy. And recent studies over the last several years show that the number is hovering right at 19%. 19% of Americans trust politicians in Washington, D.C. 19%. If you're into fractions, let me put that in a fraction form for you. That's less than one out of every five people trust politicians. All right? And that's been going on now for some time. Now, there, there were a couple of rebounds during this 50-some-year time period. Back in the 1980s, there were several years in a row that that percentage jumped considerably. 50-some percent even hit 60% of Americans trusted the leadership in Washington, D.C. Okay, that was back in the 80s. And that happened, that, that, that played out, according to the studies, for a few years, but it didn't last, you know, beyond that, and then it plummeted back down again. The spike, the highest spike of all, as far as people trusting people in Washington, D.C., um, took place in uh, uh, the tail end of 2001 and 2002. Remember what happened right at that time? Yeah, that was 9-11. And... Uh, and it, it spiked up to about 80%, not for a, a very long period of time, but about 80%. But by the time January 1st, 2003 rolled around, boom, it was back down again to these low percentages. But it's been over the last nine years, it's been historic lows. 19% is where it has been now for, for a good number of years. It can be... a it can be easy to allow that to play in to our attitudes, to sour our attitudes and the way we talk about politicians. I mean, when you stop and think about it, 80% of people do not trust politicians. And so the odds are, you know, given any situation, whether you're at the water cooler at work or whether you're you're at some restaurant and bump into some, some neighbors you haven't talked to in a long time, or you go to a class reunion or something like that. You know, if 80% of people don't trust politicians, then the likelihood is most times you're around people. You're around people that, that have that attitude. And so that can be a self-perpetuating thing, and it can generate a sour attitude, even a stronger sour attitude within us. Here's what I want to do. is I want to, I want to challenge both you and I. I want to challenge us with something that as Christians, we adopt a different attitude. We adopt a different approach. And I'm going to do this from the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 5 through 7 which is probably a section of scripture you're not that familiar with, but here's what it says. Build houses and settle in the land. Plant gardens and eat the food they grow. Get married and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and let your daughters be married so they can also have sons and daughters. Have many children in Babylon. Don't become fewer in number. Also do good things for the city where I sent you as captives. Pray to the Lord for the city where you are living. Because if good things happen in the city, good things will happen to you also. All right, so here's the situation. And when it says, do good things for the city, you know, it's talking about, the New International Version says, seek the prosperity of the city. Okay, kind of different terminology, same message 
no. Here's the situation. The people were in Babylon. I talked about Belshazzar a Sunday or two ago. Well, um, this was a little earlier. This was when his grandfather sat on the throne, Nebuchadnezzar. In 597 B.C., the Babylonian army conquered Israel. And in effect, they ended up taking the king prisoner, and they started deporting people in waves. I mean, one of the waves involved like 10,000 um, Jews that they took. And they didn't take the poor. They didn't take the weak people of the land. They kind of left them there, and they imported people from other co conquered countries in and settled them in Israel. But what they did is they took the established people. They took the people that held promise and significant people, people that had their feet on the ground and their head on their shoulder and, you know, seemed to be understanding about the way they were living their life. Now, those were the people they were especially targeting. And so they would deport them into captivity, which means that they would travel like a 600-mile road around the Arabian desert in order to get to Babylon. They were in a foreign land hundreds of miles away that none of them had ever been before and none of them cared to be at now. This Babylon, I've talked before about how it was such a cultural and architectural wonder. It was like the premier city of all of the world in, in the way it was constructed and what it housed. But it was also extremely idolatrous, filled with pagan worship. It was a totally different setting than what all these Jewish people were familiar with. So they had been uprooted and they had been transplanted in this pagan country. And these are the instructions that God is giving them through his prophet Jeremiah. And he's saying, guys, I want you to build houses here. I want you to have kids. I want your kids to have kids. I, I, I want you to do good things for the community. I want you to, to help people there in Babylon. I want you to pray for the city. See, he's given very specific instructions here in regards to the approach and the attitude that should, should um, exist among the people. And part of why that is so significant is that if in the context, if you back up to Jeremiah chapter 28, the chapter leading into this, what you're going to read about in chapter 28 is that there were some false prophets who were assuring the people that you're not going to have to stay in Babylon long. You're going to be there maybe two years, and then you'll be coming back to Jerusalem. And that was the false message that was being given. That's not what Jeremiah was saying, but that's what these false prophets were saying. And so because of that, some of the Jewish people, some of the exiles, and it was kind of gaining momentum, this kind of thinking, they were attempting to withdraw from society and avoid contact with pagan Babylonians. They wanted to remain untainted, untarnished. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with the society they were in. And they were just kind of trying to be all huddled up and just count off the months until two years were up and then they'd be able to go back to Jerusalem. But it's in the middle of all of that that, that God makes it very clear that that isn't what he wanted for them. And that's why he said the things that he said right here in this passage. He says, you need to be praying for, you need to be helping, you need to be blessing the city you're in. Now, in view of all of that, let me show you three more verses that are found in that same chapter, and these are verses that a good number of you in here are familiar with. Some of you have memorized these verses. A lot of you have read them in Christian books that you've read. If you have devotionals, devotions have been written on these verses. It's these three verses. And the thing is, we, oftentimes when we look at these verses, we don't understand them, not in their context. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, 
This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The context is they had just been uprooted from their homeland that they had lived in for generations. They were put forcibly in this pagan land and they were going to have to live there the rest of their lives. They were never, this generation that that was spoken to, they were never going to end up going back to Jerusalem, to Israel. We like to look at that and we just think, God has our welfare and our benefit in mind and he, you know, he wants this for us and that for us, which all of that is true. But the context is, is that that was the case in a very questionable environment, in an unfavorable environment, an environment that, didn't, that wasn't real conducive to try to reinforce a relationship with the living God. God was telling them in no uncertain terms that they need to be engaged in their surroundings, that they need to pray for, they need to be involved with, and they need to seek to influence for the good. Now, I just want to say this. I want to say that our situation isn't near as dire as what it was for them in Jeremiah 29. Not even close. I'm not saying things are perfect in the United States. I'm not saying things are perfect in Washington, D.C., or over in Topeka. I'm not saying things are perfect in every police department. I'm not saying that. Because there clearly are some things that uh, need some attention. And that should concern us. To some degree or another. But the bottom line is this. God doesn't want us to withdraw from society any more than the people in Jeremiah's day. Our citizenship is on the horizon. It's in heaven. Jesus is coming back. And we're going to end up spending forever there in his presence. But we're not there yet. And for the time being, we have a responsibility here where we find ourselves. We have a responsibility toward our leaders. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God the things that are God's. Does that include taxes? Yeah, it includes taxes but it includes a lot more than just paying your taxes. Our ushers are going to get up at this time, and as we prepare for communion, um, I, I, want to, I want to encourage you to do two things here. I want you to, uh, to spend a little bit of time in just reflecting what it is that the Lord has done for you to make a home in heaven a future reality, a part of your future that you will one day spend forever there in his presence. You will be transformed into his likeness and, and that's the promise. That's where our citizenship is and that's where we're headed. And I want you to spend some time thinking about what it is the Lord did to make that available to you. That's why we take the bread and we eat it in the cup and we drink it. We're reminded of what he did when he went to the cross and he died on our behalf. But I also want to encourage you to spend a few moments during this time reflecting on the temporary citizenship that you have right now here in this country. What kind of a citizen are you? And do you pay your taxes? Do you gripe and complain? Do you ever pray for your leaders locally, nationally? God's word's pretty clear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and for the opportunity to be able to talk about what we've talked about here today and for the clarity that's found in your word. And I pray, Lord, that as followers of yours, we indeed will be good citizens. 
both here and now, and one day forever in your presence. Thank you for giving us this dual citizenship. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.